Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God provides his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So all that joyous occasion stuff still applies. And Paul is talking about the difference it will make in our lives. We have been justified through faith is a summary of the message of the earlier verses in the book. Paul presents this justification as a past experience. This is at the heart of the gospel message. We who once were sinners destined for judgment have been redeemed through Christ's blood and justified or declared right with God on the basis of our faith. The first blessing enumerated is peace with God intended in the Old Testament sense of the Hebrew shalom, a sense of general well-being, the source and giver of which is Yahweh. It only comes from God. Our sins have been forgiven, and our guilt is removed, and we have been made right with God. This peace to, comes to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is both the means of our salvation and the Lord of our life. There is no possibility of experiencing the peace brought about by salvation except through him. The second result of justification is access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. By access, Paul is likely signifying entrance into the audience chamber of the king. And he is especially thinking of the king of kings. There is a twofold basis for this interest, entrance. Christ, because his death has made it possible, and faith. These two come together to make it possible for us to come before our God. We now not only have access, but actually stand or have our whole being within God's realm. Our citizenship is in heaven. Yet we not only have peace and access to grace, we also have an entirely new basis for boasting. It's now all right to brag. Paul said that all boasting in the law is excluded on the basis of the principle of faith. He had said that Abraham not, had nothing to boast about because he believed God rather than depending on his own works. Yet here, as we go into boasting, we are allowed to boast not in ourselves, but in the hope of the glory of God. Our boasting is about God, not we, ourselves. The earlier passages forbade bragging over human achievement, while here we have pride in God and what he has accomplished on our behalf. Pride is sin when it centers on yourself, but valid when it centers on the accomplishments of another. When it's your children, you can brag. When it's your God, you can brag. Our hope is a glorious trust 
in an anticipation of the promises God has given regarding the future. The primary challenge to the joy of our salvation, namely our sufferings or our afflictions, probably include trials in general and even persecution. Paul says that Christians should rejoice or even exult in these difficulties, not meaning that we should be happy in our troubles, but that we should delight in where those troubles can take us, what it can do in our lives, the difference that can be made as we go through them and come out the other side. The New Testament teaching on trials is quite illuminating. In Hebrews 12, trials are looked at from the standpoint of God, a loving father who must discipline his children. First Peter 1 looks at trials from the standpoint of who we are, namely of greater weight than gold. If gold must be purified by fire, how much more do we need the purifying effects of all kinds of trials to be made pure? James 1 looks at trials from the standpoint of their results. Through them we learn perseverance and thereby become mature and complete, not lacking anything. In all three passages, the true goal of trials is to increase our faith, meaning a God-centered, God-dependent way of life. Paul shows the results of our afflictions, indicating the reasons that we can rejoice in suffering. The very first quality produced by suffering is endurance or perseverance, an independent, unyielding perseverance in the face of aggressive misfortune made possible by Christian hope, Romans 8, 25. It is often connected with faith, in God during hard times. It is clear that in adverse circumstances, believers are expected to display a steadfast hope that enables them to remain faithful to God and to run the race of life in the way that God has marked out for us. Endurance will then produce proper Christian character. The Greek word for testing occurs only in Paul's writing in the New Testament, but it is part of a word group used at that time of testing and purifying gold by bringing it to the boiling point. You ever feel like you got to the boiling point and one more thing is going to explode? But Paul talks about bringing us to the boiling point, thus allowing the lighter materials, because gold is one of the heaviest of metals, to rise to the surface where the goldsmith can skim them off. Sometimes when we reach the boiling point, God can use that to skim off that stuff that comes to the top that's making our blood boil. And then we can be better on the other side. Tested character will produce hope. It was used in four, verse, chapter 4, ch verse 18, to describe how Abraham in hope believed and therefore became the father of many nations through Isaac. Hope makes it possible to endure, and at the same time, the process of enduring and the godly character it produces increases our hope by making us continually reflect on the future realities guaranteed by God. So the four, suffering, perseverance, character, and hope interrelate and define the Christian approach to life in this world. Hope is at all times active. It doesn't sit there passively. That is, it must always be demonstrated in the kind of victorious living that results from the experience of Christ and brings glory to God in difficult times. Paul elaborates on the meaning of hope by saying that it does not disappoint us. Christ has died for us, and to be justified by faith is evidence of God's love for us and proof that we are delivered from his wrath. 
That's the basis of our hope. Not disappoint means literally will not put us to shame and alludes to Old Testament passages that teach that the child of God does not need to fear shame or judgment because of relationship to God. We have hope because God has poured out his love into our hearts, not our love for God, because there may be moments in our life where that doesn't measure up, but God has poured his love into our hearts meaning we realize God's love as an inner spiritual experience at the deepest level of our being. And the spirit is the means by which God's love is poured into our lives. The Holy Spirit is a supreme gift that makes it possible for us to know the gift of God's love. As Augustine says, it is not by ourselves but by the Holy Spirit who is given to us, that this charity shown by the apostle to be God's gift is the reason why tribulation does not destroy patience, but rather gives rise to it. The Holy Spirit fills us with the love of God and gives us the strength to endure. And our hope is grounded in the very depths of his love. All of us were still in a state of sin when Christ died for us. Powerless or weak refers to the complete inability of every sinful person to accomplish anything of eternal consequence. This does not mean that human beings are incapable of good, but it conveys that they can do nothing that will make them right with God. Ungodly is a stronger term and refers to living without regard to the proper religious beliefs and practice. In contrast to Christ's death for the ungodly, Paul goes on to say human love at its very highest level will sometimes move a person to die for a righteous or a good person. The righteous person would be a morally upright individual one for whom we have respect, but no particular attachment. The good person is one whom we have close relationships. It could be someone who has given us, who's been a benefactor to us in our lives, or a relative who has done a significant good to us. Paul's point is that we might be slightly more willing to die for a good person, for someone that we are in relationship with, than we are a righteous one. But it's more important to emphasize the astonishing love of Christ, who died for the ungodly, who deserved nothing, and at that time wanted absolutely nothing to do with Christ. This is especially seen in the fact that God not only loves us, but demonstrates his love for us. Anyone who loves another person tries to give concrete proof of that love via certain actions. That's why you men are wearing red carnations this morning. We want to show that we love you. God proved the depths of his love in a way none of us would want to do by giving his son to die for us. Yet it is far more than that. He did so while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies. This is the primary point Paul is making. Christ. Christ didn't die for righteous people. He didn't die for his friends. He died for sinful human beings and all their degrading depravity. For those who suppress the truth by their wickedness and do not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Who were people who were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Therefore, we deserve the to experience the wrath of God and eternal judgment. But Christ took our punishment upon himself and paid the penalty in our place, thereby procuring redemption on our behalf. 
Much of the time, people feel like God doesn't love them, especially if they have trouble or tribulation, if they're going through tough times or trials on every hand. They cry out, why me? Then there are those who, are on, who on the inside feel ashamed of everything they do and everything they don't do. They always feel guilty, and it doesn't matter whether others speak good of them or bad of them, they still feel guilty on the inside. Then others, deep down, are plagued with a fear of failure, which acts itself out in perfectionism, or avoiding all risks, or in anger and resentment, anxiety and fear, or pride and depression. Why do people live like this when Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? You do not have to please or appease God. Jesus has already pleased and appeased God for you. He has already credited righteousness to you. Visualize two ledgers, if you will. On one is a list of all of your sins, everything you did wrong, every right that you did not do. And on the other one is the righteousness of Christ. Now exchange the ledgers, yours for Christ. That's one way of picturing what justification is, transferring your sin to Christ and his righteousness to you. Paul puts justified in a past perfect tense, meaning that someone has accomplished something in the past and it still has a continuing effect through the present and into the future. Therefore, if you have trusted in Christ for your salvation, you are justified by Jesus both now and forever. Today I want to focus on three truths that in justification Jesus has pardoned your sin provided for your righteousness, and put you in a right position with your heavenly Father. The reason we need to focus on this is that most often we're unaware of how thoroughly Satan has deceived us. He's led us down a path of destruction, captives of our inability to meet our own standards consistently. Satan has shackled us in chains that keep us from experiencing the love, the freedom, and the purposes of Christ. The primary deception is that success will bring fulfillment and happiness. So again and again, we try to measure up, thinking that if we meet certain standards, we'll feel good about ourselves. But again and again, we fall and feel miserable. How can we get off this treadmill of trying, this platform of performance? How about by transforming our thinking to the biblically-based truth about being justified by Jesus? So first of all, in justification, Jesus has pardoned our sins. Justification means God has forgiven you of your sin. He has released you from the debt of of death that you owe. The difficulty we deal with is accepting it and then forgiving ourselves. But justification carries with it no guilt and has no memory of past offenses. Christ paid for all your sins at the cross, past, present, and future. You are completely forgiven by God. But then there's Satan, the father of lies, and he twists and distorts the truth so that his deceptions appear to be more reasonable than attractive than the truth. Remember how he directly questioned God's truthfulness in Genesis 3? And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan was implying that Eve could have greater significance apart from God. She went for it, and Adam followed in sinful rebellion. 
Humanity lost its secure status with God and began to struggle with feelings of arrogance, inadequacy, shame, guilt, despair, and valuing the opinions of others more than the truth of God. And Satan's lies still thrives today. For example, man, humanity, is above all else. Humanity is alone the center of all meaning. But the truth is, living without God at the center of life, humanity sinks lower and lower in depravity, by blindly following a philosophy that intends to raise the dignity of man, but it instead it ends up lowering the dignity. The truth is, apart from Christ, humanity is enslaved to sin and condemned to an eternity in hell. But the good news is that even while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly and justified us by giving us a pardon for our sins. Second truth in justification is Jesus provides for your righteousness. As marvelous as it is, justification means more than the forgiveness of sins. In the same act of love, he also provided for your righteousness, the worthiness to stand in God's presence. He has given you his righteousness, uprightness, integrity, worthiness, significance, meaning, value, purpose, and the list goes on to negate all of the negatives. By imputing his righteousness to you, God attributes Christ's worth to you. Imputing righteousness is extending or applying the quality of Christ's righteousness to you, putting that inside your spirit. The moment one accepts Christ, God no longer sees that one as a condemned sinner. He sees that one is accepted and makes you acceptable through your faith in Jesus. He sees you as a saint. You are forgiven and you receive Christ's righteousness. In the beginning, God declared that humans were created to reign with him. And then humans rejected God's truth. Today, we continue to reject God's truth and choose instead to trust in our success and in the opinion of others to give us a sense of worth. Since the fall, humanity has often failed to turn to God for the truth about oneself. Instead, we look to others to meet our inescapable need for worth and value. We reason, I am what others say I am. I will find my value in their opinions of me. When in reality, only Jesus provides for our righteousness, our inner sense of significance and our worthiness to stand in the presence of our heavenly Father. Finally, in justification, Jesus puts you in a fully pleasing position. The moment you accept Christ, you are forgiven. You receive Christ's righteousness and you are placed in a fully pleasing position with God. He sees you as a new creation, fully pleasing to him. God intends that you be put right with him and fully experience his unconditional love and eternal purposes for your life. You are forgiven. You are righteous because of Christ's sacrifice. Therefore, you are pleasing to God in spite of all those things that you see as your failures and that others help to remind you of. If you can grasp the spiritual reality, it will replace your fear of failure with peace, hope, and joy. Failure does not need to be a millstone around your neck for neither success nor failure is the proper basis for your self-worth. Christ alone is the source of your forgiveness, your freedom, your self-worth, your significance, your joy and purpose. The focus of your Christian life should be on Christ if you're to feel that condition of being fully pleasing to God. 
However, some people have difficulty thinking of themselves as pleasing to God because they link pleasing with performance. They tend to be displeased with anything short of perfection in themselves and suspect that God has the same standard. The point of justification is that you can never achieve the perfection in and of yourself on this earth. Even your best efforts at self-righteousness is as filthy rags to God. Yet God loves you so much that he appointed his son to pay for your sins and to give you his own righteousness, his perfect status before God, and his fully pleasing position in his presence. My question is, do you feel that you are justified freely by Jesus deep down on the inside? It's not focus on what he has done, not on what if not, focus on what he has done, not on what you try to do. Place your faith in Jesus for your total justification today.